fundamentals test six. We're talking about some engine stuff here now. Uh, let's all overhead valve engines do what? Do they use an overhead camshaft? That's not right, is it? Not all of them have an overhead camshaft. Uh, do they use the camshaft to close the valves? Does yes the camshaft no. close the valves? Yes and no. No. Well, it allows the valves to close. What is it that closes the valves usually? The, uh, springs. The springs close the valves. I mean, the valves are held shut by springs. And uh, they don't operate on a Wankel cycle, which is what we were just looking at. Uh, they have the valves located in the cylinder head. Overhead valve engines have the valve limit. Now this is a crazy thing. If you call the parts house and the car that you're talking about has either got overhead cam or the camshaft in the block, which basically, uh, if you've got, you know, here's your here's your heads on a V engine, right? All right. Now here's your crankshaft. And the ones like the little three liter that I got in my car were a 350 Chevy or a 302 Ford. The camshaft was here and there was push rods going up here that would operate the valve. But the valves were still up here above the piston. On the other ones, you've got a camshaft here, you know, with being driven by these long chains. Uh, some of them will have two here. That are doing my long chain. Some of them will have one gear, but they'll have two camshafts because the camshafts will be geared together under the valve cover or whatever. But anyway, uh, what's crazy is the people at the parts house, all of these engines have got the valve over the piston, right? But they'll say, they'll want to know if it's OHV or OHC. Overhead valve or overhead cam. But that's a misnomer because all of them have the valves overhead. What is an engine you can think of that has the valves anywhere except in the head? You ever took a Briggs and Stratton lawnmower engine apart? One of yeah. the older ones? The valves are in the, in the block. And all those flathead engines, like the old Continental engines they put in some of the forklifts and industrial applications, and the old engines that Ford used to build eons ago when they built the first V8, the valves are in the block. Oh, you know, the axle. Well, compare the relationship or the position of the uh, cams being over the valve or the valve being over the cam. Exactly. Is that cam overhead valve or overhead cam? I don't know. I mean, I don't know where they came up with that. Okay. A single overhead cam V8 engine has how many camshafts? Two. If it's a V, it's got to have two, right? It's like I was talking about up here. If it's single overhead cam, that's why they call it single overhead cam. Yeah, me and Donnie used to call it SACO. <laughs> but single overhead cam. Uh, the coolant flow through the radiator is controlled by what? Thermostat. The thermostat. If the, the water pump is actually, uh, you know, providing the impetus for the coolant to flow, but if the thermostat's closed, now whenever the water pump is pushing water, it's actually there's going to be some that bypasses the thermostat and, and goes where? In the radiator. Yeah, it actually goes to the heater core. It's not going to go to the radiator. It goes to the heater core first and then back to the radiator, typically. Uh, or you know, back in there, so they want the heater to, they want the hot water to go to the heater for first. Basically, is how that works. Okay, and it's, like I say, that's going to vary a little bit from vehicle to vehicle because nobody does it. I mean, a lot of them do it the same way, but nobody does it exactly the same way. Um, now, torque is expressed in what? Pound feet. Yeah, pound feet. That sounds strange because we say foot pounds, but if you look, even on that really expensive split beam snap-on torque wrench I got out there that we torque lugs with when we remember to do it. And Brandon. <laughs> but uh, anyway, those things, uh, if you look, it says pound feet. It actually says pound feet. And that's why on your in your book, you'll see Olbs foot. Why did they ever come up to abbreviate pound with libs or elves? Well, I wish I knew the answer to that. Somebody probably would know the answer to that off the top of their head, but that person's not me, so I don't know. Uh, LBS pound. Looks like it'd be PNDS or something, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm kind of like you on that. Um, okay, uh, foot pound. Make sure. If you say, this one guy was telling me pound feet in here, you know. I mean, all my life I've heard foot pounds, but pound feet's really the right way to say it. But I told him, I said, that's fine, but if you go out there when you're working a bunch of, not a bunch of regular mechanics that work every day, and you start saying pound feet, they're going to think you're an idiot. So say foot pounds when you go out there to a shop somewhere. I mean, nobody says pound feet, even though they may know that's how you're supposed to be saying. Uh, horsepower is what? D. 
It's actually A and B. It's a measurement of engine power and it's calculated torque multiplied by engine speed and then divided by 5,252. Why specifically 5,252? Five, it's got have to do with how much a uh, horse can move a particular unit of weight. Yeah, I mean, 500 you know, pounds. Yeah. yeah, how far you can move in a certain amount of time and all that. I mean, I, that sort of stuff is sort of, if you're just gathering vast amounts of knowledge so that you can win trivia contests, that's okay. But, you know, I mean, there's, you can actually, uh, that's, a, that's an internet search question. If you don't know exactly how did they come up with that, and in the books that, I, you know, that I've taught out of all these years, they always show a horse moving a load a certain amount of time and blah, blah, blah. Now, one cylinder of an automotive four-stroke cycle engine completes a cycle every what? 180 degree. Wait a minute. It completes a cycle, meaning what? It goes intake. Compression, power, and exhaust is going 720. Yeah. 200, two different, two entire full turns of the uh, crank. Right. You got that? Okay. How many rotations of the crankshaft are required to complete each stroke of a four cycle engine? Two. Yeah, well, one half. One half rotation of the crankshaft, one half at uh, each stroke. Now, how many strokes are there in a cycle? Four. Four. So if it turns two times, right, that's half, isn't it? So in other words, it's going to move 180 degrees for each piston. Like if you're, if you're just looking at one piston, uh, the crankshaft's going to turn half a turn when it piston moves down. All right. How many rotations of the crankshaft are required to complete each stroke? Or four? Never mind. I already just read that one. Duh. Uh, let's see. You need to get some more coffee, don't we, Sean? A rotating force is called what? A. Eccentric movement? Where did you come up with that? No, it's torque. It's oh. basically torque. Yeah. Technician A says the crankshaft determines the stroke of the engine. Technician B says the length of the connecting rod determines the stroke of an engine. Which technician is correct? What's the stroke? How do you define the stroke? If somebody asks you, I don't understand what the stroke means, think about this. Your wife, your girlfriend, whoever says, what is the stroke of a piston? What does that mean? You know, I mean, I don't want, you know, she sees the crankshaft and the metal parts laying out here. She wants to know. What are you going to tell her? What if I wanted to increase the stroke of an engine? What would I have to do? Decrease or increase the size of the connecting rod. The connecting rod is actually only going to, it's going to move the same. It's going to put the piston in a different spot. You put a longer connecting rod, is it going to increase the stroke? No. I mean, it can't really, can it? The, the length of that on the crankshaft. You think about it. If you've got a little, like say, you've got a little, these little, a little crank, and you've got to turn a pulley, right? Okay. If you've got a little crank that's really short, see, that's a crank. Got that? Okay. This right here has got a longer stroke than that one. This is gonna make a bigger circle, isn't it? If you turn it this way. So that you can see that. All right, this one here is going to make a bigger circle than one that's got a shorter rod here. Got it? So this, the crankshaft, the throw on the crankshaft is what determines your stroke. You got a longer throw on that. I had this Jeep, uh, 47 Willis Jeep, that I traded my cousin out of one time. And I went and bought, and I'm saying this for a reason, uh, if you've got a short stroke, then it'll rev up really fast, but it doesn't have a lot of torque. You got a long stroke, you got a lot of torque, but it's harder for it to rev. See, if you turn it a little bitty crank how fast you can turn it, a longer crank's hard to turn fast, but you got more power. Got it? Well, this Jeep was had a long, uh, was a long stroker, and uh, it had, uh, well, in addition to the long stroke, the connecting rods were really long. It's a peculiarly built engine. I put rings and bearings and all that hogwash in it. And um, heck, I guess I was 18, 19 when I done that. But I said. Uh, I was trying to get it started. It had an old rope seal on the crankshaft, and it's hard to spin because that rope seal was biting the crankshaft on the back, you know, for the rear main. And so I said, hook the trailer ball. I mean, hook the, uh, it had a trailer hitch on the front of it that you fold up, you know, and I hooked it over the ball on my dad's 66 Chevy pickup truck. And I took off across the field pulling that thing. I had it in, you know, some, some forward gear. I mean, it just had these stems sticking up. I didn't know what was four wheel drive, what was two wheel drive, or anything else. And when I headed across the field, that thing started up 
And when it started up, it pushed that Chevrolet pickup all over the place where I could get it choked because <laughs> it was in four-wheel drive. But that thing really had some power. But now they didn't. They burned a lot of gas, and it wouldn't go about 45 miles an hour without feeling like it about to come apart, you know. But uh, you remember I told you Tucker, Preston Tucker built something similar to a Jeep that he's trying to sell to military, military that would go over 100 miles an hour, and it was air-conditioned and bulletproof. And, <laughs> and they didn't want it because they said, we don't need anything on the battlefield going 100 miles an hour. Had that big machine gun bubble on top of it with them two guns out and all that stuff. But uh, they bought the machine gun bubble from him and put it on the B-17, but they didn't want his vehicle. Um, okay, uh, so the crankshaft is what determines the stroke of an engine, right? So how many degrees of camshaft rotation are required to complete the four-stroke combustion cycle? Think about it now. What turns faster, the crankshaft or the camshaft? What's got the smallest gear on it? No, come on, Sean. Wake up. The little gear on the crankshaft and the big gear, you got a gear twice as big on the camshaft, so the bigger gear means it turns half as fast. 360 degrees, right? All right. 360 degrees. The camshaft usually on the older engine used to turn the oil pump. Uh, how is diesel fuel, and also the distributor were turned by the camshaft too, by the way. Why wouldn't you turn the distributor with the crankshaft? I mean, doesn't it need to, the distributor needs to be timed to the, the camshaft, not the crank, doesn't it? Because it's firing, you know, the firing events are timed to the operation of the valves instead of the operation of where the crank is. I mean, it's sort of where the crank is, but if it was, how would it know when to fire? However, now listen to this, on the coil pack ignition, the camshaft, it fires on the intake and exhaust every time. Every time that piston comes up, that spark plug fires on those. Doesn't hurt a doggone thing for it to fire an exhaust because the power's all going to mostly going to the place anyway. They call that a waste spark system. Have you ever heard about that? It's, they used to do it on motorcycles years ago. One for two. Huh? One pack for two. Yeah, yeah, one pack for two. Ever the companion cylinder? How is the diesel fuel ignited in a diesel warm diesel engine? Compression. Yeah, it squeezes that air, makes it really hot, and he's uh, I mean, two pound, two fair, two degrees Fahrenheit per pound of compression. You got 450, 475 pounds of compression, you got nearly a thousand degrees of temperature in there. When the engine is cold, the heat that's made by that compressing air is absorbed by the cold engine parts, and so they have glow plugs. And the glow plugs actually get it to the point where it'll fire up when it's cold. Um, which diesel injection system requires the use of a glow plug? Indirect injection, that's the IDI. Uh, it's got the actual, it's actually an indirect injection system has got the uh, injector spraying into a little chamber that's, you know, got an opening into the combustion. Direct injection is the one that squirts right into the combustion chamber. Uh, what fuel system component is used in a vehicle equipped with a diesel engine that's seldom used on the same vehicle equipped with a gasoline engine? Look at those answers. Fuel filter, fuel return line, water fuel separator, fuel supply line. You guys ever seen a water fuel separator on a gas burner? I haven't. I mean, I may be missing some, except you used to have that little sediment bowl on some of your old lawnmowers and stuff, but that, you know, you could look in that little glass bowl and see if you had trash in there. They took those off years ago. How many of you remember the gas pump that used to have the little uh, clear uh, ball on the side of it, a little whirly gig that would spin in there when you was pumping the gas, you could see the gas. Do you ever see that? That's cool, you know, how they used to do that. I mean, that was in the 1960s, just better, you know, all the gas stations we stopped. Mama would say, how much is this gas? Wow, 23 cents a gallon? Just get a dollar's worth and go on down the road. We can beat that price somewhere else. <laughs> and the hamburgers were a dime back then, you remember? All right. I mean, a nice size hamburger was a dime, but now she only made 54 bucks a week. So, you know what I'm saying? All right, here we go. Uh, let's see. Uh, the diesel injection pump is usually driven by what? What drives the distributor? The gear off the cram uh, camshaft. The injection pump, consider the injection pump on the ones that have injection pumps on them as being your uh, distributor for a diesel. And I'm going to tell you something else briefly about a diesel. These lines, these fuel lines that go from the injector pump to the injectors, see that, that those, the pressure in those fuel lines runs about 18, you know, 100 to you know, however many thousand pounds. I mean, it's a lot. 
And so they actually, whenever that pressure pulse goes, is shoved out there by that pump, it pops that injector spring loose and, and it sprays fuel in there through little teeny tiny holes you can't even see with your eyeball. I mean, if you look at the tip of an injector, most of the time you can't even see those holes. But there's, few, there's holes there. I don't know what they cut them with. I guess a laser or something. Or some drill bit from Germany. I don't know. But anyway, uh, what they do is uh, those things pop. But those lines going to those injectors from that pump cannot be bent. Now this is something that's going to stand you in good stead one day, so don't ignore me. Watch. You cannot bend these any tighter than a certain radius without causing a problem. And you'll see all those lines are snaked over there to the injectors on them, but they're real stiff, they're real hard, they're made to handle lots of pressure. But every single line has got to be exactly the same length. And I knew about a diesel engine one time that was skipping on one cylinder, and everybody was just driving themselves crazy trying to figure out why it was that it was skipping. That had good compression, the injector was good, the injector had been replaced, somebody had replaced the line, and they just got a piece of line and sort of ran it over there and put the right kind of fittings on it. And it wasn't it was a different length than the other injectors and so it caused that engine to skip. I'm talking about a different length than the other line. All the lines have got to be the same length. That's why they snake them around and go this way and that, but they've got to have the radius. They can't be bent any sharper than a certain radius. There's a lot more to that than you think there is. You know, so anyway. All right, then, um, let's see, uh, let me look here, let me go down, which one am I on? Okay, yeah, that was number 14 with D. Which diesel system applies high-pressure diesel fuel to all the injectors at one time? That is a high-pressure common rail system. Only, uh, the common rail injection systems have got these rails that the injector is hooked into, and, uh, and they got a pump. And on the on the General Motors, like on the Duramax, uh, this pump, you know, is it's a Bosch design, so that the the little bit of suction that's created by this pump is supposed to pull the fuel from the tank into the. Uh, and if you've got any kind of an air leak in the line between the fuel tank and this pump, you're going to have running problems. On the uh, the Dodge and the Ford, now GM may have changed this, but on the Dodge and the Ford, there's a fuel pump that pushes the fuel into the injector pump. But the common rail system is going to have, listen to this, if it's got, if the pressure, I mean, this pressure is controlled by the computer with a little solenoid, 27,550 pounds. 550. Okay, now, what does that mean? That means if you're working on one of those and you decide you want to crack a fuel line and maybe see if there's some fuel there and it's, at, you know, it's wide open, then it can just cut your hand slam off. I mean, that's how much power is there. Go into your bloodstream and you would surely die and all this kind of stuff. So you got to respect the pressure. Even when it's idling, the pressure is like 5,000 PSI. See on those. Common rail. That's the common rail. Remember that. Got that? Okay. Now then, um, let me see here. Which of these takes place during regeneration in a diesel particulate filter? Regeneration is when soot is being burned. The particulate filter, did you know on one of these new diesel engines uh, that's got a particulate filter in it, the air that comes out of the exhaust pipe in somewhere like Los Angeles is cleaner than the air that's going in? That diesel engine's cleaning the air as it drives down the road, you know something? I mean, the air that's coming out back is, is carbon dioxide, which is not hurting a doggone thing. But it's uh, it's really, really something how it cleans it up. Okay, selective catalytic reduction uh, uses, uh, I mean, uses urea injection to reduce NOx emissions. NOx is oxides of nitrogen. Huh? Pretty much using urine? Yeah. Okay, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. Whenever you go above 2,500 degrees in the combustion chamber, these get locked together in various uh, compounds. The reason they call it NOx is because that X can be just about any number. It can be a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all that. And so we don't, we really don't want to form that, basically. We're going to try to keep it cool. EGR is on the vehicle for that purpose, right? 
You can tell this is a Monday, can't you? Diesel engine, this diesel engine, the one that you're seeing in this picture, is which type? Huh? Well, look at look at it now. Look what you got here. Heat your fuel injector on that one is spraying into a chamber, and your piston is down here in a little combustion chamber, and the piston's here. So it's spraying into this chamber. So what is that? It's not spraying directly into the chamber, so it just about has to be indirect, right? When compared to a gasoline engine, the diesel engine may blank what? Heavier. It's a heavier engine and more robust the way it's made. Okay, does you guys do you guys know something now that you didn't know before? What'd you learn? What'd you learn? What'd you pick up? <laughs>